The Cats get their Premiership defence back on track with a brave win over the Bulldogs. Darwin delight as the Suns continue their surge towards September. And is a Brownlow medal fancy in hot water with the match review. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. This is The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, we're into the bye rounds and we'll start tonight at Marvel Stadium where Geelong got its Premiership defence back on track, kicked the final six goals of the game to beat the Western Bulldogs. What a performance it was. There's Tom Stewart. We'll get to him shortly, but he had a big say on these proceedings and then they just stood up. I just thought their pressure, their intensity, their contest work to match the Western Bulldogs when at times it looked like the Dogs were going to run away with this game was outstanding and with the players that they had out of this side, Dangerfield, Duncan, Holmes, Guthrie, Radagalia, Stanley, Clark, Menegola, like the quality out of this Geelong yeah. side, for them to do that against a Western Bulldogs team that wants for nothing really, they, they've got as talented a lineup as anyone in the AFL. That was a huge win to keep their season alive. Four Premiership Cats, as you mentioned from last year, missing this game through injury. Before tonight, Liam Jones was just about in all Australian form, the way he was intercepting behind the ball, but you picked up something that Geelong was able to do. He took 10 intercept marks last week against Gold Coast, so tonight he went to Hawkins. We're going to see some of his clips. So what Geelong did, they didn't allow him to play high up the ground, so he went to Hawkins. Hawkins was always the deepest forward. You see, he kicks that goal there, and then he clearly got a hold of him at times as well. Led on, up on him. Now, not a huge night offensively mm. for Tom Hawkins. Had a couple of moments, but he's worked defensively and his positioning to make sure that Liam Jones couldn't disrupt Geelong's ball movement across the centre-half forward region, as he has done so well uh, this season so far, was a big reason they won the game. So it didn't take an intercept mark. Yeah. Three touches, and as we've seen, was largely ineffective. Great coaching and great execution from the Geelong players. Three disposals, as you mentioned. Zero intercept marks and zero intercept possessions as well. It was a strange game because the Western Bulldogs dominated basically every statistical category there was. So have a look at this. Plus 74 in disposals, they controlled that. Plus 19 contested ball, they won tackles, but they lost. <laughs> yeah, they, they did. I mean, Geelong were terrific off turnover. So they, they did get beaten at stoppage, but not, not badly. So yeah. they matched them in there. And at one stage, it looked like the Bulldogs were going to get dominance from the centre bounce because Tim English was huge. Yeah. Bontempelli was having his moments, although he faded out of the game. So to do what they did tonight on the back of those numbers mm. and the personnel missing, uh, it's one of their better wins for the year. You want to go behind the goals to look at some Tom Stewart vision and the way he was able to intercept. He's just so smart. So this is just one piece of play here. Look, look, he's the free defender behind the ball and the Bulldogs are out. Like, this is fast play off a turnover. And look how Stewart cuts off the angle so they have to go back. And then he hands over with Buse and goes, OK, I don't need to be free anymore. I actually go up and impact on Hugo Hagen there. And then Buse slid back as the spare behind the ball. Some of his positioning tonight... It's hard to measure how many goals he actually saved. So yeah. We always talk about forwards that kick goals, but he, he may have saved six or seven goals tonight. And then when he gets the ball, he's such a beautiful user and he set them up time after time. We'll head to Darwin now and TIO Stadium where Gold Coast secured a massive win over Adelaide. They were 35 points down before they kicked nine straight on either side of half time. Yeah, so this team's now got real character. I think at times we've questioned that. They've had mm. opportunities to win. They've either been level at three-quarter time and then been blown away. Well, last week they were really challenged and tonight they're challenged against a good Adelaide side and they're just resilient. They're tough. Their contest work is as good as any. They've led really well. Well, Wits was huge tonight, got the better of Riley O'Brien from the Crows, and this man we'll get to in a second, but he's kicked his third bag of five this year, Jack Lacocious. Yeah. Humphrey's gone into the midfield, made a big difference. Rao was ineffective in the first half, I think just four touches, but said, nah, I'm just going to wheel my team over the line and mm -hmm. end up with ten clearances. So one of Stewie Dew's better wins, yeah. they've won four straight in Darwin, and that really keeps them in finals contention. So it was their fourth biggest comeback of all time. Obviously, that was their maiden campaign when they came back from 40 down to get their first ever win over Port Adelaide, but 35 points down to beat a real finals yeah. contender. So Adelaide away from home, I mean, that's mm. their real issue as well. They're a completely different team away from home. So yeah. flat track bullies on Adelaide Oval, mm. essentially, and away from home, they haven't um, been 
clearly uh, as effective and I guess that's a big weakness for them and we can't really take them seriously until they can rectify that. We head to the moment now. So after Gold Coast kicked nine straight, Adelaide actually hit the lead in the last quarter. They're only 10 points down when this happened. Chase Jones ruled to have overstepped the mark, which took Bailey Humphrey right to the goal line. I want you to watch the replay, Kane. I'm not actually sure he goes over the mark right at all. on the spot. It's, so it's just a massive penalty for something that shouldn't be. Like a 50 metre penalty for that. Mm. You've got to at least call him back if you think you've stepped over yeah. before you penalise him straight away. There was no warning for Chase Jones. Now we saw that with the Ainsworth one with the Gold Coast and Bulldogs game the mm. previous week and that umpire actually lost his position and was yeah. dropped. I'd suspect the same thing will happen to that umpire. You can't be making simple errors like that that have a big influence on the game. We head to our Saturday star now and it is Jack Lacocious. He just loves Darwin. He's kicked 10 goals in two weeks up there at Terro Stadium and he kicked five tonight. He was the match winner. What a season he is having and he's a bit reflective of Gold Coast. So at times we've questioned his laconic nature, we've questioned his competitiveness, we've known he's had the skill but was more prone to playing cross half back loose and getting easy ball. Mm. The decision to put him as a permanent forward has been absolute genius. So him and King now, as I said, his third bag of five this year. Last week Geelong earlier on in the year and then that one against a good defensive team like Adelaide. Uh, and on the season 23 goals and well and truly in All-Australian contention. He might well be. Isaac Rankin might have been in All-Australian contention before tonight. He was well beaten against his former side, though. Goals for the first time this year from just 13 touches and a really frustrating evening Just for him. rattled, wasn't he? Just, just genuinely rattled. And we can see some bizarre behaviour, really, from Isaac Rankin. He just wasn't focused on what he should be focused on. So he had two effective kicks. Two effective kicks for the night and we're seeing the by play off the ball so well done to Gold Coast for able to get inside their former teammates head here and have a big influence on his performance because it's about as poor a game as he has played certainly his poorest game at Adelaide first time he's gone goalless and this before the start of the third quarter was really strange sort of stuff and then this one we've seen him kick this all year just wasn't able to so a pretty disappointing night for Isaac Rankin, one he'd want to forget against his former side. Let's head out west now to Optus Stadium, where Collingwood eventually got the job done against West Coast. This was meant to be a cakewalk. Noah Long kicks this goal, and it's back to 14 points late in the third. You know what I loved? It was that the West Coast were in a game that was relevant. Like, for the first time, you actually wanted to turn on and, and watch the game that they're playing in. Largely, I just tune out when West Coast are playing this year. Not today. So they brought real <laughs> effort. There was nothing scientific about what they did in that third quarter. Now, eventually, we know the story. Collingwood were too good. They had too many legs. They had too many rotations after the Eagles were struggling with the injury again. But for that third quarter period that you mentioned, West Coast had a real crack. <coughs> and their better players came to play. Sheed had 43. It was the best game I've seen Elliot Yo play for years. And yep. he's had his body issues. But his power, seven clearances for Yo, 16 contested possessions. In the end, this was Collingwood putting them away, but you could actually walk away yeah. from that performance as a West Coast fan going, OK, I can actually be proud of that mm. performance and well done to the 41,000 who showed up again at Optus Stadium, the best fans in the competition are the Eagles fans. It didn't feel like a 10-goal game. Now, Jordan Degoe, one of the Brownlow favourites going into it, I reckon he's going to face potentially a month-long suspension for, for this bump on Elijah Hewitt, just a couple of games under Elijah Hewitt's belt, first-round pick last year, but... I reckon this will be great at severe impact. Hewitt left the ground with concussion with uh, high contact and careless conduct. So I reckon that's straight to the tribunal looking at three plus. Yeah, it's a dirty act. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And why he would choose to do that with everything that we've known this year against a defenceless 18 year old. And Jordan Ngoi really struggles to go a full season without having a mishap. And this is another one of a different variety, of course, but a player with such talent has never been all Australian. He's in all Australian form this year. He's in Brownlow form, as you said, to make that decision in that moment was careless, it was reckless and it was a cheap shot and it should be every bit of four weeks. How do they replace him? you well, got Carmichael or McRae who can go through the midfield, Jamie Elliott potentially Well, I think back. Dacos is the one. Yeah. I, I think Nick Dacos and we saw that in the third quarter when they were under the pump. He goes in there. He's 
a great player across half back, but he's a more damaging player when he's getting his yep. possessions in the forward half. So Elliot will come back in some stage. They can shuffle the decks. They've got great depth and a lot of versatility in their lineup. But I'd love to see Dacos play the Dugowie role. So Collingwood's 11 and 1 now, and it bodes well for Premiership success. So since 2000, these are the teams that have finished, been 11 wins after 12 games. Five of the nine have ended up being Premiers. Eight of the nine have played in a grand final. Just call the season off. That's it. It's done. No, but they're, they're obviously in a real, real good position. Uh, they're clearly the best team in mm. it. And then there's a group of probably four or five on the next rung yep. of the ladder. So Bo McCreary hurting his ankle. Will Hoskin Elliott hurt his ankle in this one. Ash Johnson copped a really nasty corky. As well as Elijah Hewitt going off with a concussion. Connor West hurt his knee. Shannon Hearn hurt his hamstring. So some pretty bruising injury tolls coming out of this. Let's head to Friday night footy now at the MCG where Melbourne defeated Carlton. Christian Petrarca was just everywhere. 32 disposals, nine score involvements, a career high nine intercepts. What a up. season he is having. He's so clean at ground level, but I think the area that he's improved is defensively. So he had the most pressure acts on the ground, 15 ground ball gets, the intercepts, you know, so just him getting back in into really dangerous spots, um, but his one-on-one -on -one strength in the marking contest and at ground level, and also just his power and speed, he's one of the more watchable players in the game, and in a game that was awful, like this was a <laughs> truly awful game yeah. of football, he was pure class, mm. and he stood out as just that. So three Brownlow votes, and, and you think he's a pretty good shot at the Brownlow medal? Yeah, I reckon he's probably just about the Brownlow fancy right now with Nick Dacus. I think Clayton Oliver getting hurt a couple of weeks ago has probably put him into pole position, I reckon. Melbourne dominated this game in its forward half, so I want you to check out these stats here. This is Melbourne's fifth, top five most forward half disposals of the season. They've won all four five games, so it just goes to show when they can dominate the Territory game, mm. they can win the game. It's also not great company for Carlton to be in alongside West Coast North and Hawthorne. Yeah, no, it's not. But that, that's why I've always oh, had strong belief in, in Melbourne because defensively mm. they're so good. Even the loss last week against Freo, we stood up here and go, OK, well, they were really good defensively, just yeah. inefficient going forward. Now, to what level did the standard of the game bring them down? And clearly there's still some issues with their forward half efficiency. I'm backing them in to click. and. Yeah. Look, they're, they're a real chance to win it because of how strong they are in that area and, and defensively. I want to take you back to a couple of weeks ago when Carlton coach Michael Voss was asked after the loss to Collingwood, so this is about a fortnight ago, whether or not he felt the problems were forward of the ball, offensively or defensively. I understand there's been some um, chatter around you know, what we need to do offensively and how we can maximise better and be more efficient going forward, but the reality is this game's imperfect. Um, there's mistakes happen. How you correct those mistakes and how you, uh, how you flick into defence quickly so you can get a ball back quickly, we're just not recovering it quick enough. You know, score was, was um, not really ticking over and they go down the other end and they score a goal against the run of play. Well, if, they, if we're not scoring, they shouldn't either and that's the standard that we've got to hold ourselves to. So he pinpointed the issue as being more defence than offence, but over the last month, they're averaging 52 points a game and only six goals a game as well. I couldn't believe it when he said that, and I said that at the time. It was both areas of their game that needed work, but it was more offensively than defensively, and clearly they have drilled down defensively yep. and they have neglected all of this. They're boring, OK? And what happens when you're playing a boring side? The crowd gets bored. The mm. players get bored. We all want to score. We want to get the footy. You want to get the crowd involved. You want to get momentum happening. It's such a momentum game, AFL footy, and they cannot score. Uh, and yep. that's a massive issue for them. Now he's admitting after the game on Friday night that they're just not good enough. Mm. And that's probably the reality of it. They're not good enough. I don't reckon they're fit enough either. I really want to drill down on, on some of their effort mm. off the ball. Now, Andrew Ru Russell is their guru fitness man who is highly credentialed, but they do not look anywhere near fit enough to me. And Melbourne, one of the fittest teams in the competition and best last quarter team in the game. And that was exposed again on Friday night. So they had a really strong start to the year. They were unbeaten after their first month. We put this on the agenda five weeks ago that it was a make or break six weeks for their finals chances. They've gone 0-5 with a game against a pretty informed Essendon inside next yeah, week. Yeah, I didn't think it would be this. Mm. I thought they'd probably get two out of that lot. But, um, yeah, what a depressing, underwhelming yeah. season. Once again, it is to be a Carlton fan. All right, we'll head to the Adelaide Oval now where Port Adelaide did it pretty easy against Hawthorne. They jumped out of the blocks in the first half. 
and their ball movement was electric. It was. So some of this play was as good as we've seen from any team this year. Now, granted, Hawthorne, for some reason, didn't turn up and weren't there right from the start and put Adelaide kicked nine goals in the first quarter. It was extraordinary. Mm. Just the lack of defensive effort here from the Hawks and the way Port Adelaide were able to break them down. But to be fair, they've been pretty good at this all year. It's been a real improvement in their game. They don't go off back off the mark. They always want to go forward. And when there's a longer option, they take it rather than taking a shorter or wider option. And Todd Marshall was just class back in this side. I thought a couple of concussions this year, but largely everything he touched turned mm. into a goal for Port Adelaide today. And their defensive transition through to their offence was uh, quick, fast and efficient. And it's nine in a row for Ken Hinckley's yeah. side. W what a season it is shaping up for him and his team. 105 points to half-time was Port's highest in the club history. And it was also uh, the highest since 2012 in the AFL. But it wasn't just offensively what they were doing. Their defensive work was just as good. You want to highlight a couple of Yeah, this of is what here. impressed me the most. So this is, all oh, these are all edits, probably in the first 15 minutes of the, of the game. We've highlighted Sam Powell-Pepper there, who is the spiritual leader physically for Port Adelaide. So he comes up from half forward. He gets involved here. Firstly, wins the ball. Now, it doesn't affect an effective possession, but doesn't give up on the play. Chases down the work rate from forward to back to then affect the gang tackle there with Ryan Burton and turn the footy over was huge. Horn Francis, top of the screen there near the umpire, was criticised early for his lack of defensive running. Well, what an improvement for him this year. It's been the biggest improvement for him, his game. So affects the turnover on Newcomb there. Port Adelaide go back and score. And here's Dan Houston having a huge season, sliding back from wing position off his opponent to take a really brave intercept mark. So we all love the big goals and Jeremy mm. Finlayson kicking four in the first quarter and the nine first quarter goals, but it was all off the back of some outstanding defensive work. To be fair to Hawthorne, I mean, it looked like it could be a 150-point game at halftime. They end up getting it back in the second half and Luke Bruce kicked five goals, including his first of the afternoon, which was his 500th for the Hawks, became just the seventh Hawthorne player to kick 500 goals. He ranks right up there among the, the modern-day great small forwards. Everyone loves Luke Bruce. You rarely hear a bad word said about him, and I just love the fact that he stayed loyal mm. to this club. He's had his success, mm. but he understands his role now is to bring the next group through, and to play half-forward in a side that doesn't win many games yeah. is tough. And he, I mean, he kicks five again. So <laughs> 400, uh, 500, uh, it's the fourth time he's... Been mm -hmm. four times he's been Hawthorne's leading goal kicker and will be straight in the Hall of Fame when he's eligible. Right, Kane, for the first time all season, let's head to the ladder now. And look at that, Collingwood and Port Adelaide starting to put some breathing space between the top two and Melbourne in third spot. What a missed opportunity from the Western Bulldogs there to mm. stay in touch with Melbourne and Brisbane with the top four. And they've got a really poor percentage. So out of the top eight sides, the Western Bulldogs' percentage is the worst. They've also got a tough next month. Yep. Adelaide, Freo and Collingwood in the next month. And a big opportunity for the Bombers as well. Uh, and once again, when Adelaide lose to those teams that are around the same position mm. on the ladder for them, it's almost an eight-point loss for yeah. them tonight. All right, and we'll look at our Sunday slate of games now. Only two because we are in the buy rounds for the first time. Greater Western Sydney takes on Richmond. Adam Kingsley against the side where he's an assistant last year. And then Essendon against North at Marvel Stadium. But it's a giant stadium where we find our Canes question for the week. Does the winner of the Giants against the Tigers still have a faint final sniff? No, but what they do have is their draft pick position goes up. Yeah, Remembering sure. that Jacob Hopper <laughs> draft pick is tied to Richmond and where they finish. So if Giants beat Richmond, they'll go up and yeah. Richmond will go down, which is a great thing for that draft pick that's tied to Jacob Hopper. Love your work, Kane. Thank you, you heaps. Too. See you next week. See you guys next week as well.